Today, I want to look at some tropes that are involved in creating a threat narrative. First of all, I'm going to define my terms once again. A threat narrative is when um, a person or a group of people creates a narrative in which they reduce the sense of vulnerability of their target, they increase their targets, the perception of their target's agency, and the perception of their target's bad intent towards themselves. In conjunction with that, this, they decrease the sense of the, the public perception of their agency, the public perception of their bad intent towards their target, and increase the public perception of their vulnerability to the target. That is a threat narrative. Now, when I'm talking about a threat narrative, I will refer to the people who are targeted by the threat narrative as the target, and the people who are perpetuating the threat narrative as the oppressors. The reason why I'm choosing the word oppressors is because oppression does not exist without a threat narrative. Threat narratives enable oppression, essentially. Now, I'm going to move on to the purpose of a threat narrative. A threat narrative essentially turns off that sympathetic response that human, pe human beings have when they see other human beings that are vulnerable. Instead of recognizing the target's vulnerability, they cease to recognize the target's vulnerability, and they do that by associating the target with threat. And what changes is that the target is no longer recognized as human, they become a predatory other. And the, the whole concept is get them before they get us. Um, a threat narrative also defines in-group and out-group. The in-group are the ones who are the victims. The out-group is the aggressors. Threat narratives also allow oppressors to maintain moral authority over their targets. They're savages, pigs, brutes, and beasts. Threat narratives keep the target in a state of continual debt to the oppressor. They owe us. It's always the oppressors that control the, the threat narrative. Oppressors are always reacting to the actions of the target. In fact, the agency of oppressors is invisible to oppressive society. A threat narrative is just that, a fiction. It's not a realistic assessment of victimization based on verifiable statistics or reasoned argument. Actual victimization leaves a paper trail. Pretend victimization is nebulous and undefined. Hyperagency. The agency of the target group is emphasized over the agency of the oppressor. Violence done to the oppressor by the target group is depicted as horrifying. It's also framed as systemic. Violent intent towards the oppressors is innate to the target group. Violence done by the target group is always more visible, more noteworthy in media, more sensationalized than violence done by the oppressors, which, when it is reported on at all, is done so in a passive voice with nothing to personalize it. The resistance of the target group against the system of the oppressor is recast as willful violence against the oppressors. Criminal behavior by the target group is seen as evidence of the target group's great power over the oppressor, while the biased nature of the legal system and its application remains invisible. Hypoagency, or damseling. The oppressor's vulnerability to the target group is emphasized at every opportunity. Violence by the oppressor towards the target group is almost always justified by depicting the oppressor as the underdog fighting against the more powerful target group, or it's simply comical. The end result is that everyone knows the target group does, just doesn't experience violence the way the oppressors do. They just don't feel pain like we do. Borgification. When a member of the target group is violent, this is a reflection on the nature of the entire target group. The target group is always engaged in a secret, widespread conspiracy against the oppressors. When one member of the target group has a position of power, all members of the target group share in that position of power. The members of the target group are objects of scorn and laughter. They're bumbling foolish, incapable of doing the least thing right without the help of the sophisticated, intelligent oppressor. They wear shabby clothing, have poor personal hygiene and manners, and are solely driven by their base drives. The target group is often portrayed as grotesques with animalistic features. They are always portrayed as being less attractive and desirable than the oppressors. 
Target group's positive qualities are always ones that are earned, thus require active effort. They are never innate and only positive if they are deemed beneficial to the oppressor. The oppressor's positive qualities are always innate to them and can't be lost through their actions. Their oppressors, the, the oppressors are more attractive, more spiritual, more moral, more grounded in practical reality, and they're so just because. The target is judged in relation to the oppressor's benefit. The target is depicted as one in one of three roles. The hero who assists the oppressor, the violent, the villain who hurts the oppressor, and the idiot who offers an emotional escape valve for his oppressor's fears and resentments. In fiction, this will make the oppressor appear as a flat character, since she is always either being helped or harmed by her target. And since the target has real consequences to their actions, consequences determined by benefit to the oppressor, but consequences nonetheless, they are often more interesting characters. Oppressors are fascinated by the drama of the target choosing right versus wrong. Less fascinating is the morally perfect yet static nature of the oppressor. Oppressors are usually obsessed with the amount of hatred the target group holds for them. They are convinced that not only every member of the target group hates them, but that this hatred is a crime in and of itself. Oppressors might give it special names and attempt to stamp it out with draconian measures. The hatred of the target group is always cast as illegitimate and never caused by anything the oppressors have done to them. Hatred towards the target group is always justified. Pointing out the violence of the oppressors is often reframed as violence against the oppressors. Deconstructing the oppressor's threat narrative is recast as constructing a threat narrative against the oppressors. The target group is asked, why are you bringing that up? You must want to demonize the oppressors. When a threat narrative has done its work and is in full steam, you can always tell its target by asking a few questions. Who does society consider invulnerable? who can't be hurt? Whose pain is society ignoring? When there's a member of a particular group who acts in a criminal manner, does society blame the entire group? Who does society consider responsible for social ills? Is the question why, as in why is the target group more violent, verboten, is the only acceptable answer because they're less human?